Jeremiah chapter 43. Now, I suppose it's appropriate for me to sort of set the stage here. We've been following the book of Jeremiah all the way through, and we're up to chapter 43 now. And in the book of Jeremiah, what's happened at this point in the story is that after Jeremiah warning the people of God, after Jeremiah prophesying it for so long, Jerusalem is finally conquered. Judah is destroyed. The kingdom of Judah has been overwhelmed by the Babylonians, and they've been taken away captive, exiled. All that are left behind in the land are the poorest and the most wretched of the land and, and some guerrilla fighters who were able to escape the Babylonians and hid out and now have come back now that the army is gone. We saw last week that under this regime, some of the people brutally murdered the Babylonian impo- um, appointed governor of the land, a man named Gedaliah. They brutally murdered him. They massacred a bunch of other people and the whole land after the Babylonian conquest was plunged into the midst of chaos, confusion, and fear. And in the midst of that, some of the men who were officers in the Israeli army, the Judean army, they said, you know, Jeremiah, we want you to seek the Lord because we think we should go to Egypt and find refuge there. Would would, would you help us? We want to seek the Lord about it. And we saw last week that Jeremiah told them, no, God does not want you to go to Egypt. You stay here in the land and he'll protect you. He'll bless you. Do not go to Egypt. And uh, well, um, they weren't very sincere in their asking. Okay, you got that background? Now chapter 43. Now it happened when Jeremiah had stopped speaking to all the people all the words of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God had sent them to him all these words, that Azariah the son of Hoshnia, Johanan the son of Kara, and all the proud men spoke, saying to Jeremiah, You speak falsely. The Lord of God has not sent you to say, Do not go to Egypt to dwell there. But Baruch the son of Neriah has set you against us to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans that he may put us to death or carry us away captive to Babylon. They asked Jeremiah for guidance. Pray, Jeremiah, bring us a word from the Lord. But they didn't mean it. They had already determined their direction to go to Egypt. And all they wanted to do was in a superstitious and an insincere way, they wanted God's stamp of approval upon what they had already determined to do. So when Jeremiah told them the truth before God, no, God does not want you to go to Egypt. Stay here and he'll protect you. Look at their reaction. They're almost violent. They're screaming at Jeremiah. They say, verse 2, you speak falsely. The Lord our God has not sent you to say... You know, it's absolutely remarkable that these men who lived through the tragic accuracy of every word of Jeremiah would now doubt him. They experienced it. For 40 years, Jeremiah is saying, Babylonians are coming, they're going to conquer. Babylonians are coming, they're going to conquer. You may as well surrender the Babylonians. Babylonians are coming, they're going to conquer over and over again. Haven't we been reading that for approximately, I don't know, 42 chapters in the book of Jeremiah? And it all happened exactly as Jeremiah said. Now, as soon as Jeremiah says something that they don't like, oh, no, no, you don't know how to hear from the Lord, Jeremiah. You you don't know how to listen to him. It's absolutely bizarre. I like what Derek Kidner, an excellent Old Testament commentator, says along this. He said, all along, had they but realized it, they had regarded God as a power to enlist not as a Lord to obey. And they still cannot believe that his will could be radically different than their own. I mean, can you believe that? That just maybe God's will is different than from what you or I want? It's possible, isn't it? That's why Jeremiah said, verse 2, do not go to Egypt, brother. They denied that that word was from the Lord. Matter of fact, look at what they tried to explain it with. Verse 3, Baruch the son of Neriah has set you against us to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans. Well, th- Jeremiah, this isn't the Lord that spoke this to you. It, wa- it, wa- it was uh, the- your assistant, your secretary. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeremiah prophesied in the face of kings. Do you think his secretary is going to sway him one way or another? It-, it was a totally illogical complaint. But these men just can't face the fact that God 
wanted what they did not want. Verse 4. So Jehanan, the son of Kariah, and all the captains of the forces, and all the people would not obey the voice of the Lord to remain in the land of Judah. But Jehanan, the son of Kariah, and all the captains of the forces took all the remnant of Judah had returned to dwell in the land of Judah from all the nations where they had been driven. Men, women, children, the king's daughters, and every person who Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, had left with Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, and Jeremiah the prophet, and Baruch, the son of Neriah, so they went to the land of Egypt, for they did not obey the voice of the Lord, and they went as far as Taphanes. Oh, my friends, in a way, in a book filled with tragedy, and can we just say Jeremiah, filled with tragedy, in a book filled with tragedy, those might be the most tragic verses in the whole book. These were people who with their own eyes saw the truth of every word Jeremiah spoke. Now, as soon as he speaks a word that they don't like, they ignore it. They say it. And a matter of fact, they kidnap Jeremiah and take him to Egypt with them. Look at verse 4. All the people would not obey the voice of the Lord to remain in the land of Judah. But By the way, I'm fascinated by that verse, all the people. Well, they got unity at least. You know, one thing that's remarkable in the Bible is how often people are unified in their rebellion against God. Do, do not think for a moment just because a bunch of people agree that it's of God. Sometimes people agree in disobedience. So they had this great agreement. Well, let's do it. Nope, we're not going to listen to God. Let's go to Egypt. And verse 5 says they took all the remnant of Judah, men, women, and children, and Jeremiah the prophet and Baruch. Because I don't want to go to Egypt. God says not to go there. Nope, you're going. Poor Jeremiah. I, I don't know how to express it exactly. Hasn't this guy suffered enough? And, and yet, in God's plan, he wouldn't even be allowed to finish out his days in the promised land. Do you remember we saw this last week? where when the Babylonians captured Jerusalem, when they were beginning to send out the captives and they were beginning to send out the exiles, they came to Jeremiah and they said, okay, Jeremiah, what do you want? If you come back to Babylon with us, we'll make it sweet for you. Do you want to come back? To and Jeremiah thought about it. He prayed about it. He no, no, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to stay here with the people. And he said, no, you're not going to stay here. You're going to go to the one place you do not want to go to. You're going to go to Egypt. And he got dragged to Egypt. He got taken there, verse 7 says, so they went to the land of Egypt. They took Jeremiah and his associates, so to speak, hostage against God. What do I mean by that? Well, Jeremiah had said in the prophecies in the previous chapter, Jeremiah had said, if you guys go to Egypt, God's going to get you. He goes, oh yeah, well, we'll take you to Egypt, and if God's going to get us, he's going to get you too. They're almost thinking that they can outsmart God and take Jeremiah as a hostage against God. But then, if those verses are some of the most tragic in a book filled with tragic verses, look at verse 8 and 9. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah at Taphanes, saying, Take large stones in your hand and hide them in the sight of the men of Judah in the clay brick courtyard, which is at the entrance to Pharaoh's house in Taphanes. Do you see how great that is in verse 8? The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in Taphanes. Jeremiah was no longer in the promised land. Against his will, and you could say against God's will, although God had it all under his plan, but, but at least against God's command, they took him there to Egypt. And ladies and gentlemen, what happens? The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in Egypt. You can't outrun the word of the Lord. You can't do it. What, you're going to go someplace where God's word doesn't apply to you? You go, no, 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 I'm going to get away from God's word. No, it's too much of God's word. No, I don't like what God's word says. i got to get out of here. You can't escape. You can run, but you can't hide. Doesn't matter. What, do you think that if you were to destroy every Bible that you own, do you think if you were somehow to get rid of it, you erase every Bible app that you have, you get rid of it, yeah. What, is God's word somehow now of no effect? It stopped working? Listen, you cannot escape this. You can't. It is the word of the Lord God who created heaven and earth. 
And even if you deny God's word, even if you go to Egypt to try to escape it, even if you do everything you can, even if you take a prophet of God hostage against God, God will still send his word and it'll get you somehow, some way. That's how relentless the word of God is. I imagine, and if I was making a movie of this, although what a terrible movie this would be, but if I were making a movie of this, when the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, a small smile would come across his face. But it works here too. You're the God of the old earth. I don't have to be in Judah to hear from you. Your word can come to me even though they take me to Egypt. Isn't that wonderful? What did he tell him to do? Verse 9. Take large stones in your hand and hide them. God commanded Jeremiah to do the same kind of thing that he was commanded to do in Judah. To do something that would illustrate and memorialize a prophetic word. So what was the prophetic word? Take these large stones and hide them at the entrance to one of Pharaoh's houses that was there in that particular city. Verse 10. And say to them, this is the message of the stones that were hidden. And say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will send and bring Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will set his throne above these stones that I have hidden. And he will spread his royal pavilion over them. When he comes, he shall strike the land of Egypt and deliver to death those appointed to death and to captivity those appointed to captivity and to the sword those appointed for the sword. I will kindle a fire in the houses of the gods of Egypt and he shall burn them and carry them away captive and he shall array himself with the land of Egypt as a shepherd puts on his garment and he shall go out from there in peace. He shall also break the sacred pillars of Beth Shemesh that are in the land of Egypt and the houses of the gods of the Egyptians he shall burn with fire. You went to Egypt because you were afraid of Nebuchadnezzar? Well, guess what? I'm sending Nebuchadnezzar after you to Egypt. How do you like those apples, God says? You see, it would have taken faith. I'm not trying to deny that. And, and a hard faith. Look, I'll be straight with you. I really like telling other people to take steps of faith. I'm into that, you know. You know, you should really take a great big reckless state of faith. Come on, brother, you can do it. As for me, whoa, whoa, let's not get crazy here. No, it would have been a significant step of faith for them to say, Lord, I know the chaos that's in this land. There are murdered bodies all around, especially in light of the massacre at Mizpah that we saw last time. Lord, it would have taken faith because of the shadow of the Babylonians. They would have had to radically trust God to stay there. But if they would, you and I know, and Jeremiah knew, that was the safest place for them to be. The safest place for you and I to be is trusting God. They went to Egypt because they thought they could be safer. I got to protect myself. You know what they probably did? Man, I got to step on some toes here. They probably said, oh, no, no, we're doing it for our children. We got to protect them. If it was just us, we'd be cool. God says, no, no, no. You trust me where I tell you to be. Trust me in obedience. But they wouldn't. And now God says, I'm going to send the Babylonians after you into Egypt. They are going to conquer over the Egyptians. Well, that ends chapter 43. Let's get into chapter 44. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews who dwelt in the land of Egypt, who dwelt at Migdal, at Tophanes, at Noph, and in the country of Pathros, saying... Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Okay, can you imagine Jeremiah preaching to this remnant who has escaped to Judah and tried to find protection in Egypt? Okay, that's what he's doing. He's preaching to them. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, you have seen all the calamity that I brought upon Jerusalem and upon all the cities of Judah. And behold, this day they are a desolation and no one dwells in them because of their wickedness which they have committed to provoke me to anger in that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they did not know, they nor you nor your fathers. However, I have sent to you all my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, excuse me, saying, do not do this abominant thing that I hate. But they did not listen or incline their ear and turn from their wickedness to burn incense to other gods. So my fury and my anger were poured out and kindled in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem. They are wasted and desolate as is this day. You know what he's doing right here in verses 1 through 6? Isn't this a little history lesson? 
All right, everybody, let's remember how it went down in Judah and Jerusalem. Let's remember what happened when they disobeyed. Verse 2, you have seen all the calamity that I brought upon Jerusalem and upon the cities of Judah. I am reminding you, my people who have now gone to Egypt, I'm reminding you of the judgment that came upon Judah and why it came upon them. Why? He says right there in verse 2, because of their wickedness which they have committed to provoke me to anger. And what it was especially was their wickedness in idolatry. Before the Babylonian exile, idolatry ran so deep in the national life of Judah and Israel that they were always running after the Canaanite gods Baal or Ashereth or Molech or Chemosh or any of these other gods. They couldn't escape them. They were always attracted to them. And God said, I see that. I am to be your God. Don't go to those other idols. Now, thank heavens that today in the 21st century, we don't have a problem with idolatry, do we? You know, I, I don't know, are you bowing down before a little statue of Baal? Are you worshiping Ashereth? Well, let, let's reset that just a little bit. Do you know why an ancient Israelite worshipped Baal? Baal was the weather god. In, in many ancient depictions, he would be depicted as standing with a lightning bolt in his hand. He was the god of the sky, the god of the weather, and... In an agricultural society where they didn't have irrigation systems, if you didn't have rain come down from the sky, you starved. If you had a lot of rain, you were fruitful, your crops multiplied, your livestock multiplied, and you became wealthy. To serve Baal was a way to ensure your financial success. Now what about Asherah, this other Canaanite goddess? Well, she was the goddess of fertility, but you know, connected to fertility, I hope I'm not shocking anybody here now, connected to fertility is sex. And they would worship, so to speak, this goddess of fertility by worshiping sex in rituals with temple prostitutes. Asherah was all about sex. Baal was all about money and, and success, and, and Asherah was all about sex. And praise the Lord today, we don't have people who worship success and sex. Ladies and gentlemen, the idolatrous heart of men and women has not changed. We're more sophisticated in it now. We know how to do it in ways that are acceptable to the society. But that idolatrous instinct is still very deep within the heart of men and women. And how does God feel about our idolatry? Look at the phrase in verse 4. Oh, do not do this abominable thing that I hate. First of all, God looks at our idolatry, and you know what he calls it? An abominable thing. Look, honestly, I'm many times, I don't look at it that way. I look at idolatry and I go, oh man, doesn't that look great? Woo. Wow. That look, Man. That's worth living your life for. What does God call it? An abominable thing. Charles Spurgeon had such a great line on this. i got to read it to you. He says, oh, says someone, sin is a sweet thing. No, it is an abominable thing. It is a delightful thing, says another. No, it is an abominable thing. Oh, but it's a fashionable thing. You can see it in the courts of kings and princes and the great men of the earth love it. Even though they do, it is an abominable thing. Though it should crawl up to a monarch's throne and spread its slime over crown jewels, it would still be an abominable thing. I wish I could write a line that good just once in my life. But isn't it true? It's abominable. If God calls it that way, it is. But it's not just an abominable thing. It's an abominable thing that God hates. You know, we think about the love of God a lot, and we should. But do you ever think about the hate of God? How about this? A prayer to pray. Can I give you an unusual prayer to pray? Lord, help me to hate the things you hate. 
What was the result? Look at verse 5. They did not listen or incline their ear to turn from their wickedness. God sent his prophets to instruct and to warn his people, but they did not listen. Therefore, they were wasted and desolate from God's judgment. Now look, uh, verses 1 through 6 were about the past. Verses 7 through 10 are talking about the present. Remember, Jeremiah is speaking to the remnant there in Egypt that came from Judah after the Babylonian conquest. Verse 7. Now therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, why do you commit this great evil against yourselves to cut off from man and woman, child and infant, out of Judah, leaving none to remain, in that you provoke me to wrath with the works of your hands, burning incense to other gods in the land of Egypt where you have gone to dwell, that you may cut yourselves off and be a curse and a reproach among all the nations of the earth. Have you forgotten the wickedness of your fathers, the wickedness of the kings of Judah, the wickedness of their wives, of your own wickedness, and the wickedness of your wives that they have committed in the land of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem? They have not been humbled to this day, nor have they feared, Have they not walked in my law or in my statutes that I set before you and your fathers? Oh, look at that phrase in verse 7, friends. Why do you commit this great evil against yourselves? Friends, isn't that sobering? Sin is against God. Do we get that? I mean, I think we often forget it, but it's true. Sin is against God, but it's not only against God. It's also against yourself. You are sinning against yourself. You're hurting yourself. You're destroying yourself. Oh God, free us from this blindness of mind that says this, sin is something good that a mean God wants to keep from me. That's the game the devil likes to play in your head. Here's the truth. Sin is something that will destroy you that a loving God warns you to stay away from. That's the truth of the matter. But he says, why do you commit this great evil against yourself to to, to burn incense to other gods in the land of Egypt that you may cut yourselves off and be a curse and a reproach among all the nations of the earth? Verse 9, have you forgotten the wickedness? The answer to that question is yes. They forgot it all. As if Jeremiah's crying his eyes out, pulling his hair out, saying, listen, you, you all, don't you remember why Jerusalem fell? Don't you remember why Judah fell? Don't you remember why God had to bring the Babylonians against us? Be- because we were idolaters, because we were wicked, because we didn't obey him. Don't go down that same road again. And here's the promise of judgment. Look at it here in verse 11. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will set my face against you for catastrophe and for cutting off all Judah. And I will take the remnant of Judah who have set their faces to go to the land of Egypt to dwell there. And they shall all be consumed and fall in the land of Egypt. There they shall be consumed by the sword and by famine. They shall die from the least to the greatest by the sword and by famine. And they shall be an oath an astonishment, and a curse, and a reproach, for I will punish those who dwell in the land of Egypt. If I have punished Jerusalem by the sword, by famine, by pestilence, so that none of the remnant of Judah who have gone to the land of Egypt to dwell there shall escape or survive, lest they return to the land of Judah to which I desire to return and dwell, for none shall, accept, shall return except those who escape. First, God gave them the history lesson. Then he gave them the exhortation. Why are you doing this? Then in those verses, doesn't he drop the hammer? I'm going to bring a horrible judgment upon you if you stay here in Egypt. Go back to the promised land. Repent of your sin. Do what I've told you to do. Obey me in this. Or terrible judgment will come. First, God tried to speak common sense to them. He tried to speak warn and tried to give the history lesson. At the end of it all, he goes, okay, if you won't listen to that, here's the judgment that's to come. Do you got the picture? Now, don't look at verse 15. Hey, don't look at it. Some of your eyes just went right down. As soon as I said that, you put your eyes down. Come on, people. Don't look at verse 15. Eyes up here, right here. What should verse 15 say? How about this? 
And there was a great wailing among the remnant who went to Egypt. And they humbled their hearts and repented before the Lord and before Jeremiah. And they said, Jeremiah, pray for us that we may be restored unto the Lord. And tell us when and how to go back to the promised land and walk in the ways of the Lord. Wouldn't that be a cool way for verse 15 to go? Uh, Does anybody here think that verse 15? Let me tell you something. With what we begin with at verse 15 is one of the most shocking. Jeremiah is full of shocking stuff. What we're going to see next here, shocking. Ready? Verse 15. Now you can look at verse 15. Then all the men who knew that their wives had burned incense to other gods, with all the women who stood by, a great multitude, and all the people who dwelt in the land of Egypt and Pathos answered Jeremiah saying, As for the word that you've spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. All right, that's just the beginning. It gets worse. But Jeremiah delivered this message to a great multitude, warning them with all their heart. And again, I, I don't want to get too sentimental here, but don't you just, poor Jeremiah. They're still not listening to him. They're still. It, what, it, what will it take? What will it take? But, but then he, he delivers this great message, and then they say in verse 16, we will not listen to you. We know that you spoke to us in the name of the Lord. We don't care. We will not listen to you. Now, I will say this. I will say this. I admire their straightforwardness. Sometimes I'd much rather have a guy say to me, you know, Pastor David, I know what, you t- I know what the Bible says. I know what I'm supposed to do as a Christian, but I'm not going to do it. Rather than give me the blah, 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 blah about this or that or the other thing. At least they're being straight. At least they're laying it down. We will not listen to you. Now look at verse 17. But we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth to burn incense to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings to her as we have done. And we and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, for then we had plenty of food. We're well off and saw no trouble. But since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we've lacked everything and we've been concerned by the sword and by famine. What do you do with this? Verse 17, we will certainly do whatever comes out of our own mouth. No, um, Jeremiah, you got the word of the Lord. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm going to do whatever I desire. Listen, let me tell you the greatest false religion that is present in the Western world. I'm not going to speak for the entire world. I'll just speak for the Western world. North America and Europe. Here's the number one idolatrous religion that leads people to hell. It's the follow your heart religion. Now, a lot of times the follow your heart religion can have a smattering of the Christian faith in it. Right? They'll throw a bit in it. They'll sprinkle it on top of there. But is it real Christianity? No. The follow your heart religion, it's not anchored in God's word. It's anchored in what I feel, in what I like. It's the the kind of attitude that says this, as in verse 17. I'll certainly do whatever's gone out of my own mouth. I'll treat religion, I'll treat faith in God like a smorgasbord where I just go and take what I want to take. It's like a salad bar. If I don't want it, I don't take it. Listen. This is the great idol of our present age. And it's reflected tragically by these people. And what do they say in verse 17? We're going to keep on burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings. Oh yeah, remember the good old days? When we get together and make our offerings to the queen of heaven. Now for the Babylonians, the queen of heaven was a maternal deity connected with the moon, with family, and with fertility. In different places in the ancient world, the queen of heaven was known as Ishtar, Athart, Artemis, or Diana. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be straight with you. It is a strange and shocking thing that the Roman Catholics give Mary, the mother of Jesus, this title, the queen of heaven. It is a strange and shocking thing, nowhere connected with the scriptures themselves. We have no biblical permission or encouragement to have any connection with the queen of heaven. 
It could also be observed that in the modern world, the queen of heaven is worshipped under other names. Mother nature, feminism, glamour. Forget about those as idols, ladies and gentlemen. God wants us to serve him. And then they think about the good old days. Verse 17, you know, when we used to worship the queen of heaven and burn all those incense to those pagan idols, we had plenty of food. We were well off and saw no trouble. You know, what this is like is they're saying, you know, before God's judgment came, things were pretty good. It's like the guy jumps out of a tall building and says, man, it was great for a while. What a rush. But the inevitable result is judgment. And that's what they wouldn't understand. Verse 19. The women also said, And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven, poured out drink offerings to her, did we make cakes for her to worship her and pour out drink offerings to her without our husband's permission? The the women say, Oh yeah, no, listen. We love to make our little cookies and cakes to the queen of heaven. We'd put her little markings on them. and Oh, a little family thing. We're all going to continue our little idolatry. Get out of little easy bake ovens and make the little idol things to the queen of heaven. It's going to be a wonderful time. But we all did it with our husband's permission, so it's all good. That's what they're saying. I can only imagine the blank look on the face of Jeremiah as they say these things. I bet Jeremiah's just saying, "I I can't believe this. How can you talk this way? Haven't you seen that the God who rules in heaven is real? So um, now let's go to verse 20. Then Jeremiah spoke to all the people. This isn't going to be nice, is it? Then Jeremiah spoke to all the people, the men, the women, and the people who had given him that answer, saying, The incense that you burned in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, you and your fathers, your kings and your princes and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them? And did it not come into his mind so the Lord could no longer bear it because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which you have committed? Therefore your land is a desolation, an astonishment, a curse, and is without inhabitant as it is this day because you have burned incense and because you have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord or walked in his law, his statutes, or in his testimonies. Therefore this calamity has happened to you as it is this day. Jeremiah tried to reason with the people. He tried to communicate to them in the very best way that he could, but they were having none of it. They pushed God until it says, until the Lord could no longer bear it. Then he goes on, continuing on into verse 24. Moreover, Jeremiah said to all the people and to all the women, Hear the word of the Lord, all Judah, you who are in the land of Egypt. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, You and your wives have spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hands, saying, We will surely keep our vows that we've made to burn incense to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings to her. You will surely keep your vows and perform your vows. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, all Judah, who dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, says the Lord, that my name shall no longer be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, The Lord God lives. Behold, I will watch over them for adversity and not for good. And all the men of Judah who are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by famine until there is an end to them. Yet a small number who escaped the sword shall return to the land of Egypt, from the land of Egypt, I say, to the land of Judah. And all the remnant of Judah who have gone to the land of Egypt to dwell there shall know whose words will stand, mine or theirs. And this shall be a sign to you, says the Lord, that I will punish you in this place that you may know that my words will surely stand against you for adversity. Did you see that? Jeremiah basically says, okay, you guys do your thing. God will do his thing. And let's see who's standing at the end. Do you really want that, friends? Look, um, It's not always easy to serve God. There are sacrifices to be made. There are deaths to die. This is why the Bible talks about following Jesus Christ as being as if it were dying to self. We're not trying to sugarcoat this in the slightest. 
But there's only one thing worse than the sacrifices you have to make in obedience to God and following him. You know what though it is? It's the price of disobedience. It's even greater. And Jeremiah says, let's see. Matter of fact, I'm kind of haunted by this phrase in verse 27. He says, I will watch over them for adversity and not for good. You know, um, do do you find comfort in the thought of God watching over you? Isn't that a beautiful thought? Oh, God watching over us, watching over us. And it is a beautiful thought. I want to think that God's watching over me. Don't you want to think God's watching over you? But you better hope that God's watching over for you good and not for adversity. Now, um, how can you know that God will watch over you for good? Well, let me ask you a question. Think about Jesus. Did God the Father watch over Jesus for good or for adversity? Uh, Good. A little bit of good or a lot of good? A lot of good. So here's the key. Get as close to Jesus as you can. And he'll watch over you for good. Outside of Jesus, we may very well experience God watching over us for adversity and not for good. Now, it's fascinating here because this very severe judgment that came upon the Judean community that went to Egypt, we have no biblical and no historical record of it being fulfilled. It's possible that it happened and we just don't have the record. I mean, look, not everything's recorded in history. So it's very possible that it happened. We just don't have the record. But you know what another possibility is? Is that they repented. It's possible that they repented. There was later a strong and vital Jewish community in Egypt. So much so that hundreds of years later, who fled to Egypt in a time of crisis? Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus. It could be, again, we don't know for sure, that they heard these words and it shook them up and they repented and God relented from this severe judgment. I'd like to think hopefully that that's what happened, but we don't have a record of that happen. Verse 30. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give Pharaoh Hophra, king of Egypt, into the hand of his enemies, into the hand of those who seek his life, just as I gave Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, his enemy who sought his life. End of chapter 44. The judgment of God will extend to Egypt as well. Now, as far as the history of Jeremiah goes chronologically, that's the end of it. What we have now to the end of the book are sections of postscripts. Verse, chapter 45, which we're going to look at, don't despair, look at chapter 45, just a few verses, we can do this tonight. Chapter 45 is a little postscript about Jeremiah's assistant Baruch. Chapters 46 through 51 are a section known as the judgment of the nations, where God's going to judge the Egyptians, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Arab people, the Philistines, the Ammonites, and then finally, in two dramatic chapters, 50 and 51, the Babylonians. And then the final chapter, chapter 52, that's a postscript back to the fall of Jerusalem again. This is the end of the chronology of Jeremiah with Jeremiah in Egypt, and we don't know what happened to him there. Maybe he died in Egypt. Maybe he found his way back to the promised land. We just don't know. Now, let's take a look at this very short chapter, chapter 45. There's a sweetness to this chapter. Verse 1. The word that Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch the son of Neri when he had written these words in a book at the instruction of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim the son of Josiah king of Judah saying. Look, if you were to arrange the book of Jeremiah chronologically, which it is not arranged chronologically, it's a jumble, this chapter would go after chapter 38 in a more chronological arrangement. So this is the word that Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch. Um, Now verse 2. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to you, O Baruch, you said, Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing, and I find no rest. Um, Do you ever prayed the little prayer of Baruch there? Look at verse 3. 
Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. Life is terrible. Things are bad. And look, I don't want to make fun of Baruch. How would you like to be Jeremiah's assistant? You, you don't even get the glory, so to speak, of being Jeremiah. You're just his assistant. Man, that, that would be a tough job. And, and Baruch, no doubt, was a man of ability. He was a man of character. He was a man of spirituality. Yet he was stuck in this very difficult place. He said, woe is me now. The Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing, and I find no rest. It makes sense when we think of what Baruch and Jeremiah had to live through. The world was falling apart around them, and even though they had been protected to their lives, they still suffered greatly. The golden age hadn't come yet, and they seemed to have nothing to build on. The future looked dark. It did not look bright. And the present looked pretty bad too. Now what does the Lord say? Look at verse 4. Thus you shall say to him, says the Lord, Behold, what I have built I will break down, and what I have planted I will pick up, that is, this whole land. Here's the first word from God through Jeremiah to Baruch. I'm not done with my work. Listen, uh, Baruch, I know you're bummed out. It makes a lot of sense. But you've got to understand, my work is not yet finished. What I built, I'll break down. What I planted, I'll break I got more judgment to do upon Jerusalem and Judah. There's more to come until it's complete, so fasten your seatbelt. But then verse 5, look at this. And do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them. For behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord. But I will give your life to you as a prize in all places, wherever you go. Apparently, some of Baruch's frustration and discouragement was due to the fact that he had frustrated longings of greatness. Lord, don't you have something greater for me than being the assistant to the cryingest prophet ever. Don't you have something greater for me than being an assistant to, come on Lord, Jeremiah? Why couldn't I be Isaiah's assistant? Why couldn't I be my own prophet, my own? Jeremiah, really Lord? I could have been somebody. I could have done something. This is the ache that gnaws away at his heart. And that's why God says, do you seek great things for yourself? And friends, the disappointment of great things that are sought and not fulfilled weigh very heavily upon a man or a woman. Careful now, don't nod your head. You don't want anybody to know you're agreeing with me right now. Could be that though, right? At at, at one time in your life, you thought, oh man, there's... It's out there. I'm going to do something. Man, people are going to know my name. And now you look at Facebook and you keep count and people just keep seem to unfriending you. (laughs) You you put up that killer post and think you're going to get a bunch of likes and and it's in the single digits. (laughs) I'm nothing. I'm nothing, you think. I sought great things for myself and what's happened to them? Listen at God's exhortation here in verse 5. Maybe he's speaking to a Baruch here this evening. Do not seek them. God turned Baruch away from the path of self-exaltation. God wanted Baruch to have the right mindset, not obsessed with, not overly concerned about his own advancement or his own perceived success. Do you seek great things for yourself? Don't seek them. Stop seeking after your own exaltation. God used this word to Baruch to speak to many throughout the centuries. You ever heard of a guy named J. Oswald Sanders? 
He coveted a certain job in a Christian organization and he almost lobbied some influential friends for it. But he was walking through downtown Auckland, New Zealand when these words came to him with authority. Seekest thou great things for yourself? Do not seek them. Consequently, he didn't seek the position. But later on, it opened to him in God's own timing. When Charles Spurgeon was 18... He applied to Regent's Park College and an interview was set and Spurgeon got up early and set out for the interview. But through a misunderstanding, he missed his appointment and he was not admitted to the college. He was absolutely bitterly disappointed. Charles Spurgeon walked through the countryside trying to calm down. His heart was beating so greatly because of the disappointment. Suddenly Jeremiah 45.5 came to his mind. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. Spurgeon never made it to college, but he went on to become the most effective preacher the English language has ever known. Please, friends, don't, don't take me wrong. God isn't saying here, put away all ambition in life, don't ever want anything more. God isn't saying that. But there there is a spirit, especially when it comes to spiritual things. There's a spirit of self-promotion and self-advancement and manipulation and the pulling of levers that God says to his servants, listen, do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. Let me take care of it, whether or not you're going to be exalted or advanced. Many of the choicest, most precious servants of God serve with very little attention in whatever it is they do. They're not known. Maybe they get up in front of people and speak, but it's not very many. And they don't trend in social media. And they don't get invitations to speak places. But God sees. God knows. And God counts them as jewels of his work of grace. I I think of how tragic it is When such a jewel says, man, I got to be lifted up so that people can see me. There are people that for whatever reason, and sometimes it makes no sense whatsoever to the logical mind. There are people for some reason God lifts them up to some place of prominence in ministry. And they should simply regard it as a gift, a stewardship from God that they should use for his glory But they should never set their hearts on it or never think that they're somehow worthy of it. God says in verse 5, I'll bring adversity on all flesh. God reminded Baruch that one day he would bring judgment on all flesh, worldly popularity, power, prestige. It'll all be swept away and that should make us less concerned with great things such as fame and popularity. You and I, we have eternity to deal with. And you know what? The best place to be famous is in heaven. Now, to seek a place for yourself, to seek a place of importance and distinction among men, it's to look for the wrong thing in the wrong place. To seek social media greatness or internet notoriety. When it comes to spiritual things, it shows a lack of appreciation of the God who will bring adversity upon all flesh. But he says at the end of verse 5, I'll give you your life as a prize in all places wherever you go. Hey, Baruch, here's the good news. You're not going to die. I'll protect you until your days are done. I got my hand on you. I haven't forgotten you. Your hand will be given as a prize. And um, you know what? Check it out. Don't you think there are a lot of shining lights in Baruch's day? You know, popular because oh man I wish I could be like that guy man that guy gets invited to things I don't get invited to man people know this guy they don't know me are we talking about those guys tonight do you realize 2,500 years later we're talking about Baruch I imagine Baruch 
in heaven right now monitoring every time people talk about him on earth and saying, I was so concerned about making a name for myself on earth that I realized God had something way beyond that. My name and my faithfulness is going to be recorded in his eternal word. Oh, Lord, you know. You know. One last thought. Do you know what the name Baruch means? Blessed. 